Hello viewers, welcome to the editorial analysis by Drishti IES. In this section, we regularly take editorials from various newspapers and news portals for a better understanding of various issues happening in India and around the globe. Dear viewers, in this section, we first try to link the editorial with our UPC syllabus. Then we go analytical in order to understand some key points and at last some important concepts. Dear viewers, we truly hope that you like this initiative taken by Drishti IES and your feedbacks are important for us. So kindly feel free to give your important feedbacks in the comment section. So without any further delay, let's commence our session. Dear viewer, this video is available in Hindi as well. If you wish to watch it, please visit our Hindi YouTube channel, Drishti IAS. For your convenience, the link for this video in Hindi has been provided in the description below. Today's editorial is taken from the Economic Times published on 4th of February 2021. The title of today's editorial is Privatization Serves a Public Purpose. If we try to link today's editorial with our UPC syllabus, we can link it with GS Paper 3, which has sections that include Indian economies and issues relating to planning and development. Some key points from today's editorial. The Finance Minister's budget speech was unbashedly bold on strategic sale and privatization of central Public Sector Enterprises, CPSEs. The Finance Minister did state that a bare minimum of CPSEs would operate in the four strategic sectors and the rest privatized. And all the CPSEs in non-strategic areas would be privatized. Now viewers, like we all know that in her budget speech, Finance Minister Nirmala Sita Ramanji came up with a proposal which said that the government aims to generate 1,75,000 crore rupees from disinvestment in the fiscal year of 2021-2022. She also mentioned that two public sector banks and one general insurance company will definitely be disinvested this year. Now, if you speak about the last year's data, it was expected in the budget that the revenue that will be generated with disinvestment of various public sector undertakings will be around 2,10,000 crore rupees. However, the amount that generated from disinvestment in the fiscal year of 2020-2021 was only ranging between 15,000 crores to 16,000 crore rupees. Now, we, was, we all know that finance minister, she expressed the requirement, what exactly is the requirement of disinvestment? And we have to actually see what exactly this investment is and how it is going to help the economy and what are the various challenges that the government has to face when it comes to disinvestment. Now, first of all, if we try to understand the definition of the term disinvestment, it means sale or liquidation of assets by the government. Usually central and state public sector enterprises, projects or other fixed assets. The government undertakes this investment to reduce the fiscal burden on the exchequer or to raise money for meeting specific needs, such as to bridge the revenue shortfall from other regular sources. Now, there is a term that we have used here, strategic sale. When we are referring to strategic disinvestment, it means that it is the transfer of the ownership and control of a public sector entity to some other entity, mostly to a private sector entity. Unlike the simple disinvestment, strategic sale implies a kind of privatization. It is to be noted here. The Disinvestment Commission defines strategic sale as the sale of a substantial portion of the government shareholding of a public sector enterprise of up to 50% or such higher percentage as the competent authority may determine along with transfer of management control. The strategic disinvestment in India has been guided by basic economic principle that government should not be in the business to engage itself in manufacturing or producing goods and services in sectors where competitive market have come of age. The idea is very clear. When we speak about strategic disinvestment, the idea is very simple that the government should not be involved in businesses with reference to either manufacturing or producing goods or whether we are talking about the service sector. Because here, 
we have done a lot of work and there are many players who are available. Now, the different approaches to disinvestment are, there are three approaches. Number one is the minority disinvestment. Now, when I speak about a minority disinvestment, it is a kind of disinvestment at the end of which the government retains a majority stake in the company. Typical greater than 51% does ensure management control. Now, when we speak about minority disinvestment, it is to be noted that government has the maximum or you can say the control, especially the management control of the organization stays in the hand of the government because government there controls more than 51% of the value of that particular organization. When I speak about majority disinvestment, so it is a disinvestment in which the government post disinvestment retains a minority stake in the company that is itself of a majority stake. That means in majority disinvestment, the government sells more than 51% of what it held before and it actually retains only a minority stake in the organization. When we speak about the third disinvestment that is complete privatization. So complete privatization is a form of majority disinvestment wherein 100% control of the company is passed on to a buyer. So this is something with reference to disinvestment. Now, this was something with reference to disinvestment. Now we have to see what exactly, how exactly the process of disinvestment it got started in India. Now in 1991, a decision was taken to follow the path of disinvestment. The change process in India began in the year 1991-92 when 31 selected PSUs were disinvested for 3,038 crore rupees. In August 1996, the Disinvestment Commission, which was at that time chaired by G. V. Ramakrishna, was set up to advise, supervise, monitor and publicize gradual disinvestment of Indian PSUs. However, the Disinvestment Commission ceased to exist in May 2004. It got completely dismantled in May 2004. The Department of Disinvestment was set up as a separate department in December 1999 and was later renamed as Ministry of Disinvestment in September 2001. From 27th May 2004, the Department of Disinvestment was brought directly under the control of Ministry of Finance. The Department of Disinvestment had been renamed as Department of Disinvestment and Public Asset Management, that is DIPAM, from 14th of April 2016, which has been made the nodal department for the strategic stake sale in the public sector undertakings. A fund named as National Investment Fund, that is NIF, was constituted in November 2005 with reference to the matters related to disinvestment. Now, if we speak about some of the recent developments that we are seeing, so we can say that in 2015, the government reinitiated the policy of strategic disinvestment in order to open up sector for private enterprise to bring efficiency in management that would contribute to general economic development. The government had set a disinvestment target of 1.05 lakh crore rupees for the financial year 2019-2020. 1.05 lakh rupees for 1920. 2 lakh 10,000 crore rupees was set for 2021. And this year, 1 lakh 75,000 crore rupees for 21-22 for this particular fiscal year. Recently, the cabinet has cleared the plan to sell 53. 3% of its stake in BPCL, 63.8% in SCI and 30.8% in Concord. Two strategic buyers, 74.2% of its stake with THDCIL and 100% of its share in NEPCO, N -E -E -P -C -O, is to be sold to NTPC, that is the National Thermal Power Corporation. 
Now, what exactly are the main objectives of this investment in India? So if you speak about some of the important objectives, so we all know number one is to meet the budgetary needs. Number two, to reduce the fiscal deficit. Number three, improve public finances and overall efficiency. Number four, to raise funds for technological upgradation, modernization and expansion of PSUs. Number five, to raise funds for golden handshake, that is VRS. Then we have to introduce competition and market discipline, etc, etc. Now, if we speak about the challenges, there are various challenges that are associated with this investment. So this investment, when we speak, the, one of the most important challenge that the government face is it affects the labor force's social security. It also raises a concern about cronism, the depressed state of market and the paucity of reasonable buyer would land in a bad deal. So these are some of the important things which we should know about this investment. Now, the welcome disinvestment strategy makes perfect sense. Policy designed as it is to better leverage private sector efficiency, provide resources for developmental purposes and generally redeploy valuable asset earning suboptimal returns. Now, what exactly the government says with reference to this investment is that if this disinvestment strategy is followed properly, then definitely the efficiency will definitely increase. Why? Because the private sector will also be coming into the market. It will also provide resources for developments. There will be new technological innovations in such fields. So that's the reason the government is quite adamant with reference to its decisions on disinvestment. The present scenario, the fact is that CPSE's post-modest return on equity. Now, if we speak about how actually the CPSEs are performing financially, so this is quite a surprising data. Over two thirds of the profits of CPSEs are confined to just three sectors. See, if we speak about the profits, the majority of the profit, the 100% profit that we are getting from all the CPSEs combined together, at least two thirds, that is almost 66.66% profit is coming only from three areas, which are petroleum, coal and power. Over 150 CPSCs incur huge losses amounting to rupees 45,000 crore annually. And we speak about the remaining or many other CPSCs. So it is a data which says that around 150 CPSCs are incurring losses up to 45,000 crore per year. Now, this is something which is quite challenging. Now, also in the last slide, we discussed about what exactly we were talking about the strategic sectors and the non-strategic sectors. Now, we have to see what exactly these sectors exactly are. Now, an industry is considered strategic if it has large innovative spillovers and if it provides a substantial infrastructure for other firms in the same or related industries. Earlier, the strategic sectors were defined on the basis of industrial policy. The government classified central public sector enterprises as strategic and non-strategic on the basis of industrial policy that keeps on changing from time to time. Now, according to the policy, the strategic sector PSUs are arms and ammunition of defense equipment, defense aircraft and warships, atomic energy, railways, etc. The banking, insurance, defense and energy are likely to be the part of strategic sector list. All the other PSUs apart from the strategic sectors fall under non-strategic sector, including power discounts. Then, the political class must reach a clear consensus on privatization and wider shareholding in public sector assets. Even as CPSCs step up their productivity level with transparent board managed corporate governance. In tandem, the center must reach out to CPSC's trade union and communicate that greater investment space for the private sector is for the greater good. Now, one of the most important challenges, like I told you before government will be to actually reaching out to various trade unions. Because I said that one of the major problems associated with this investment is that there is a slight fear in the mind of the workers. The workforces have an issue with reference to that. They say if disinvestment is introduced, 
their social security will be in trouble. Now, it is complete responsibility of the government that government has to take everyone, whether we are talking about the opposition or we are talking about the trade unions or we are talking about the people, the government has to make sure that they are spreading, they are reaching out to each and everyone and they are addressing the problem of each and every person. Only then the disinvestment process can be peaceful and government can achieve whatever it want to. Also, the government has to ensure to the trade unions, especially that when this investment will take place, definitely it is for the greater good. Because when private sector will come, the efficiency, the work environment, the technology, everything will going to change and it will have a positive effect on the output. So this is one of the most important responsibilities that lies ahead of our government. The disinvestment target for the next fiscal year is rupees 1.75 lakh crores seems daunting. But note that this investment of BPCL, Air India, Shipping Corporation of India, IDBI Bank, the Kong Container Corporation, among others, is a carryover from this pandemic affected fiscal. So can well be expected to complete it soon. Now, if we speak of the disinvestment target that has been set for this year, which is 1.75 lakh crore rupees. Now, it seems to be quite huge target. However, if we take the carryover from the last year's disinvestment process, in that case, we can expect that the government might be able to achieve the figure of 1.75 lakh crore. Because like I told you in the beginning, that the government targeted for the fiscal year 2021, that it will be generating at least 2.1 lakh crore rupees. However, only 15,000 to 16,000 crore could come. So yes, carry over from last year and the disinvestment process which will happen this year, it might make the amount to 1.75 lakh crore rupees. Two public sector banks and one public sector general insurance company will also be privatized. The centers resolved to form a special purpose vehicle for unlocking asset values in CPSCs like real estate is sensible as would timely closure of sick and loss making units. The privatization will serve a public purpose. Now government again and again is saying that privatization is for the greater good. With private organizations coming, there will be a plenty of job creations and moreover, the manufacturing sector, which is suffering at a great level right now, will definitely get a boost if the private organizations come and they also participate in the same. So what we can expect in the time to come is that government has a lot of challenges to face, especially with reference to disinvestment. How government is going to convince the people, how government is going to con uh, convince the trade unions and the opposition will be something to watch. So viewers, this was with today's editorial analysis. The questions can be framed with reference to today's analysis are number one. Is it good idea to privatize even the profit making public sector enterprises? Give reasons in support of your answer. Another question that can be framed is discuss the advantages of disinvestment as a mode for mobilization of resources for the government with recent cases. So viewers, I hope you liked today's editorial analysis. Thank you very much.